Welcome to Education Insight. I'm Lacey Kendall. In 2021, we frequently heard on this program that economically, the Inland Empire must get more locals of all ages through college to meet the workforce demands of our region. In 2021, California invested $47 billion to help students from all income levels pay for college and increase the number of degree earners. But data shows that much of that money was left unclaimed. Here in the Inland Empire, often because of the lack of information and knowledge on how to apply, and because federal aid application forms are so daunting, Today, we're digging in to learn about college affordability and access, to gain a better understanding of student grants, loans, and the billions that are available right now for students from all backgrounds to use for college. And what's being done to make the process easier to apply and make college affordable and accessible for residents of our region? We'll discuss that. Someone who understands the benefits of student financial aid is Inland Empire resident Angel Rodriguez, who used grant funding he received to cover his education expenses all the way through a master's degree, and was recently appointed by Governor Newsom to serve on the California Student Aid Commission. He joins us later, as does Catalina Sefuentes, an expert in college and career readiness for Riverside County's Office of Education and the chair of the California Student Aid Commission. But first, we welcome to the program E.T. Windsor, Director of Strategic Outreach and Engagement at Federal Student Aid, an office of the United States Department of Education. His job is to work with experts from various departments at the federal level to find solutions that equip students with two things, tools to make better education decisions and opportunities to begin that process. Mr. Windsor, welcome to Education Insight. Well, thank you, Lacey. Mr. Windsor, we we constantly hear that California has some of the lowest in-state tuition prices at public colleges and universities and some of the most generous needs-based financial aid programs in the country. Is that actually true? Well, I've definitely seen data to support the cost the lowest in state tuition, as you've indicated. When we look at the 51 states and territories, California ranks uh, around number 15 uh, as far as having lowest in state tuition. Now, in regards to the need based financial aid programs, those are, are a little bit harder to compare uh, from state to state. So I, I really can't speak on that, but you know, I'll take your word for it on, on uh, <laughs> that. That's that. What is the FAFSA and what does that have to do with student aid? Well, the FAFSA is an acronym for Free Application for Federal Student Aid. Now, it's used to determine uh, an individual's level of financial aid eligibility. It is a requirement. Uh, If a student is going to receive any federal student aid, that they must complete the FAFSA. This is also a requirement for students to receive a lot of state aid, and as well as uh, some schools uh, utilize it uh, to determine the eligibility for it. Now, I would encourage students and, and, and their parents To get more information on this, they could go to FAFSA.gov. That's where the application is housed. They can complete it right there online, or they could go and download the application on a mobile app, and it's at My Student Aid, and it's available in the uh, Google Play Store as well as the the App Store uh, for those who use iPhones. Mm -hmm. When we were preparing for this program, we repetitiously saw reports of money for student aid that actually went unclaimed. Is that uh, true, Mr. Windsor? It, it is a true statement, and, and I'll explain yeah. what happens. I think there is a, a, a case where we find a number of low-income students and, and, and their families will determine or make a decision to not complete the FAFSA. As I answered before, the FAFSA is a required document. If you're going to receive a Pell Grant, uh, which is one of the most common programs available for our low-income students to pursue their first undergraduate degree, they have to complete that FAFSA. And, and that's what's going to be the information from that FAFSA will be used uh, to determine their eligibility. Okay. Now, some of the reasons for people not completing the FAFSA is, is very, but what we're looking to do at Federal Student Aid is that we're making steps uh, to address issues 
that we, we believe and we've heard that's a barrier to students getting financial aid. We're going to continue to work to modernize our programs so that they're more beneficial for students and their families. Uh, one example this past fall is that we launched a, a redesigned and simplified tool that students and families can use to estimate how much financial aid they could potentially receive when they fill out the FAFSA form. So imagine students and, and their parents thinking, well, I may not be able to get financial aid, but they could use this, this federal student aid estimator that we have available online on our website uh, and, and our website is studentaid.gov. They can go in and use that to see if they would possibly be eligible for financial aid for Pell Grant in particular. That to me should increase the number of family mem- of families that do go on and complete the FAFSA. Further, we're, we're looking to simplify the FAFSA form. Uh, we're also going to be doing some early awareness and outreach efforts that will focus on boosting the participation of low-income students in accessing those high school educational opportunities. Bottom line is that you know, long-awaited changes to the FAFSA form will make completing the form easier and that the simplification effort expands the eligibility for many types of student aid. So we, we recognize this is an issue, uh, but we do we are addressing many of the issues that will resolve it so that more students who are eligible to receive these funds will go through the process and complete the process and be able to receive the aid once they attend a post-secondary institution. Okay. So these students and their families go ahead and they apply for the funding. How does the Department of Education's Federal Student Aid Office determine who's eligible for that assistance? So we started with the FAFSA, uh, that they do need to complete the FAFSA. Uh, they also have to be a high school graduate. Uh, so those are, are really the, the big requirements. Uh, we do require them to be a U.S. citizen or an eligible non-citizen uh, to receive uh, federal aid. But uh, we also encourage those students who, who may be in other categories to inquire in their state because their state may have financial aid that, that they award to them. And many of them uh, require the student to either complete a FAFSA or some sort of a state application. The uh, post-secondary school that they will be attending is also involved in the process. And in that way, I mean, they would be enrolling in a program. So the school will be able to determine uh, and inform the student of which uh, programs at the school are eligible for uh, federal student aid, uh, as one example. Uh, and one of the misconceptions is that I think a lot of people believe that you can only get uh, federal aid, uh, Pell Grants and student loans if you are going for a four-year degree. And, and that's just not true. Uh, we have students who will pursue uh, one-year degrees that will get them prepared for a career in a high-demand field. And those programs, many of them are also eligible for financial aid. So, uh, And we do have a very good website where they can check to see which programs are eligible and as well as working with their school. Uh, We would encourage them to go to collegescorecard.gov in order to look up schools in their area or really across the country uh, to see if there are programs that they are interested in where they could receive financial aid. Uh, We would also encourage students who may only want to go to school part-time because you don't have to be a full-time student, but for many of the programs, you do have to be at least half-time But for Pell Grants, uh, a student can be uh, enrolled even less than half time and receive some portion of a Pell Grant. For students who've been to school before and may want to return to school, we will check to see if they had previous student loans that they defaulted on. So a student should make sure they keep their student loans up to date because that is one way to lose your eligibility for federal student aid is if you took out a loan and, and defaulted on it in the past. Yeah. If you just joined us, you're listening to Education Insight. I'm Lacey Kendall, and we're speaking today with E.T. Windsor. He's the Director of Strategic Outreach and Engagement at Federal Student Aid, an office of the U.S. Department of Education. And we're talking about the struggles and the opportunities for students seeking financial aid here in the Inland Empire, as well as around the nation. When we think about those that are applying for financial aid, most of us probably imagine a student coming right out of high school, but many others are eligible as well, right? I mean, I'm, I'm wondering about adult students 
student parents and veteran students, for example. No, you're you're absolutely right. And and we've recognized that and, and we've created a number of resources to help those populations. And what I would encourage uh, those who are interested that fall into those categories to do is, again, go to our website, studentaid.gov, and they can Google it. And, and for those adult students, just as one example, just put in, put in studentaid.gov adult. It'll take them to a checklist that they can use for college preparation. It gives information for those adult students, whether they've been to college before and maybe they're returning after starting their career, but they want to go back and either complete a degree or pursue a new opportunity. You mentioned veterans. Another another opportunity, same thing, studentaid.gov, put in veterans. There's a, a lot of information available there. Uh, but there we also have some information for scholarships for military families. So uh, maybe that, that veteran has not only for themselves, but maybe their, 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 their kids uh, are getting ready to go to college or, or, or other family members. And we also have a lot of information for them to provide uh, so that they can look up education benefits for service members through there. We also have uh, some dedicated information for parents that are that are available. And uh, again, I want to keep repeating our website so your listeners will know at studentaid.gov when they first pull up that website, they'll see a link right there for the parents of students. So we encourage no matter what age your, your child is, it's never too early uh, to start uh, looking for that. And we, we have checklists out there that can kind of help them go through and prepare based on where they are in their educational journey. We're speaking with E.T. Windsor from the Federal Student Aid Office at the United States Department of Education in Washington, D.C. We're talking about new opportunities in student aid here in our region and on the federal level. More in a moment. I'm Lacey Kendall, and this is Education Insight. Welcome back to Education Insight. We're speaking with E.T. Windsor from the Federal Student Aid Office at the United States Department of Education in Washington, D.C., and talking about new student aid opportunities here in the Inland Empire. Mr. Windsor, I remember one particular student trying to get into college. You're talking to her. And uh, probably many others who have described financial aid, the whole process as rather confusing. I've heard the word cumbersome or intimidating. Are you aware of any ways that you can make that process easier if you're applying for aid? Absolutely. And and, and first, every year, uh, there's millions of prospective students and their families that begin to think about uh, further education and training. You know, almost immediately, uh, they encounter that, that rite of passage that we know as the FAFSA form. Uh, It's a mandatory application, as I've mentioned, for student aid. Uh, Right now, uh, we are charged with carrying out some new laws that will overhaul the FAFSA form. And and by doing so, it's going to transform access to federal aid. And and really, the laws are designed to simplify and streamline the form for easier completion. It's going to expand access to Pell Grants and to student loans. Uh, It's going to help students afford the cost of college, and we're greatly automating the verification process, which has been one of the big pain points uh, when it comes to applying for financial aid. One of the things that we're doing is improving the the exchange of of tax data. That's that's one of the elements that we use in order for a student to complete the FAFSA form, and we're making it a lot easier. So instead of having to key in a lot of information, that information is automatically populated uh, due to some recent laws that have been uh, implemented. And you know how the government works. You know, change of this sort of magnitude involves massive IT mm-hmm. processes, uh, modifications. And, you know, it's going to take a couple of years for us to get everything in place. Uh, but the change is coming. And, and we're going to see these improvements. And it should prove to be beneficial uh, for students and their families, but particularly for those low-income families that we really are designed that we need to really serve a whole lot better. Okay. If one of our Inland Empire or Southern California students that are listening to the program today 
decides in the future to take out loans for school. Mr. Windsor, what advice would you give them about taking the loan, about using those funds in school, and even after leaving college? What can you tell us about that? First thing I would tell them is, is, and I use this phrase, know before you owe. And what that means is that they should make uh, informed decisions. And specifically, I think students should know first what, what they're interested in doing and how their interest relates to the world of work. Uh, what are they going to do with that post-secondary uh, education or training that they get? Uh, they need to know that there are different pathways that lead to a desired career. Uh, not every student will want to go to a post-secondary institution. They may want to choose an apprenticeship in order to get to their career. If you're looking for a career that requires a four-year degree, then look into that as well and, and look at the pathway that can get you there, which may include doing uh, a couple of years at a, at a community college uh, where maybe the tuition is lower. They should also know what careers that they want to explore. Many schools are doing some great work with career readiness programs uh, while they're still in high school or sometimes in middle school. Check into that information through their schools. They need to know how to compare schools before they start to take out student loans or, or even enroll at a school. They need to look at the information. I mentioned collegescorecard.gov as a resource. They can go out there and compare schools to compare costs, compare graduation rates and, and other information such as that. That will help them, I think, to make more informed decisions about where to attend school. Uh, they should know the probability of them completing their educational objective. Once again, that information is out there for students who have historically attended different colleges uh, and universities, that they can find that on collegescorecard.gov as well. One important thing they need to know is how to access free money. Uh, I always say start with the FAFSA, but that's not the only source of what I would say is free money, money that you don't have to pay back. There are scholarships out there. They should look for scholarships. That, that should be something they begin looking into very early in their journey. They could start certainly at ninth grade. They can start even earlier if they're motivated and start looking into scholarships. And if they find something that matches them, go ahead and apply. It never hurts to apply. Uh, the only thing I would encourage them is uh, you shouldn't have to pay money in order to get money. So if someone is asking you to pay a fee to apply for a scholarship, I'd look at it seriously. You know, Maybe move on to the next opportunity. A couple other things. I think they need to know how to compare financial aid and college costs at different schools. Some schools may show a higher cost, but it could be that that school also offers more financial aid when you compare it to others. Very important. They need to know alternatives to debt uh, to pay for college. Uh, I mentioned apprenticeships. Some students are able to do internships, other work programs to help pay for college. Uh, there's also some some very interesting programs around uh, particularly in California, there are some uh, the college uh, college promise or the promise programs. Those are available through a lot of the uh, the community colleges throughout the state. And the last couple of things I would say they should know is know based on what you're planning to pursue uh, in post secondary school, what you expect your earnings to be. So start looking towards the future. Uh, decide, you know, is it worth taking out that student loan for the earnings that you're expected to make. And that's going to help you determine what level of debt is too much debt. And always know that you have resources uh, at our office at studentaid.gov. There's, there's, there's ways that you can communicate with us through using uh, our, we have a chat bot, as well as you can call uh, representatives uh, at Federal Student Aid, and, and they are able to help you help answer questions, as well as the colleges in their area are certainly willing to help them. Yeah. E.T. Windsor, the Director of Strategic Outreach and Engagement at Federal Student Aid, an office of the U.S. Department of Education, helping us today to understand student aid and, as he put it, what you need to know before you owe. <laughs> Good advice. We appreciate your time, sir. Thank you very much, Lacey, and I appreciate the opportunity to speak with your listeners, and, and I hope this information is helpful for them. You're listening to Education Insight. Federal government and the state of California are offering more money than at any other time for Californians returning to college. Much of it, though, is being left behind, and that's partly because the applications are so daunting. Catalina Sapuentes from the California Student Aid Commission is an advocate 
helping Inland Empire students make it through the application process, succeed in their education, and graduate. She has some innovative ideas on how to make that happen. Catalina, welcome to Education Insight. Oh, thank you for having me. I'm so excited for the conversation this morning. Could you tell us a little bit about the commission and your role there? Sure, I'd love to. So um, the California Student Aid Commission is the organization, the commission, the branch that gives out state fi- all state financial aid um, to uh, students in California. So if you receive a Cal Grant um, in your undergraduate education, some of the um, previous um, grants that we've delivered have been, you know, the Apple Grant and currently the Golden State Teacher Award to help um, the impact and enrollment of new teachers into the profession since we have such a shortage in California. So pretty much any state financial aid for California students runs out of the California Student Aid Commission. And so our role as commissioners as a, as a board is to not only um, help navigate and support the direction of the commission, but in, um, ensure that students get institutions get their funding timely, students get their funding timely to pay for their education. And um, just to kind of set direction and hopefully support our governor and our legislature to, to empower them to and support them to to make big changes, bold changes for California students. Our big mission right now as a commission is to go after college affordability. Recently in the news, Governor Newsom is signing legislation to improve college affordability and increase access to higher education. Uh, he has done that. What are the potential impacts of that for students right here in the Inland Empire, Catalina? So one of the biggest pieces, um, like I said, the 20 years of more than 20 years that I've we've worked on that I would say in addition to his packages, just making FAFSA and California Dream Act, um, a requirement for our school districts in K-12 public schools to ensure students have the support and submit their application. And so we are the fourth in the nation to do that. Um, and we're just so excited because we know we leave millions, millions and millions of dollars on just on the federal table alone. We have so many students in California that if they just would have done their FAFSA, they would have received a Pell Grant, right? A Pell Grant's a federal grant. So that is probably one of the biggest, you know, so many takeaways in, in his budget. But I would say the two um, big things that people have to look forward to is that, I mean, these systems, I used to be a school counselor and every year, you know, even no matter how many times we went into classrooms and we went into, um, to talk to students about it, it's important to do your FAFSA. You know, we get the students that say, no, I'm not going to do it. And if we don't have systems in place to ensure their parents understand what they're opting out of, right? When you have first generation communities like the Inland Empire, you have a 15 and 16 year old making this decision without even understanding it or their family's understanding. So now that we have this in place, it starts next year um, with class of 23, 2023, those conversations will start happening, right? Parents are going to be able to make informed decisions and understand what they're submitting, understand why they should submit it. Our dreamers will not have to live in hiding and maybe they submit the California Dream Act or maybe they they don't because they're afraid. We're going to have to open up conversations and really support all students. And the, uh, the Student um, Aid Commission is working on also building not only resources to get the FAFSA and the California Dream Act submitted, but also partnering with agencies like Immigrants Rising for, to provide listservs of scholarships for those students in California that don't qualify for either application. We do have students that maybe are recently arrived to California. They've only been here a year or two, but they'd like to continue um, school after, after high school. Um, what, what's available to them right now as well. So that's probably one of the pieces I'm you know, most excited. And it's been some, just something I've, I've wanted so long for the state because I've seen the impact. And I think the second part is um, another one, just because it's such a need if you're a K-12 educator right now, um, the Golden State Teacher. And the Golden State Teacher Award is to give teachers in highly need fields and and challenging uh, school districts that have need, Title I school districts, you know, um, money to pay for their program to make a commitment to education. So not only do we get them in the classrooms, but we get them to stay. Yeah. Here on Education Insight, so often we hear about great programs and great ideas, but they're not applying to all students. So when we talk about affordability and access in the Inland Empire, is it fair to say that we're doing a good job of providing equitable access and affordability to all students here in our own backyard? No. (laughs) And I would say, I would say no. And I would say, um, 
Um, we, in terms of this, in terms of what this state's trying to do, right? What our governor's trying to do, our legislature, uh, creating access is creating, you know, passing a bill like FAFSA completion for all students. Everyone has to get help, right? That's ensuring equity. All students across the state will receive the support. But what happens is, you know, let's say they get their FAFSA and they do get submitted, you know, and then we put those things in place. We have things like, for example, within California, amongst in our own county, we have promise programs. And, you know, promise programs are free community college for our students. And so amazing opportunity for students, um, regardless of their middle income, lower income, to go to community college to um, and get their tuition and fees covered. But what happens with those promise programs is each of the community colleges, they can do those programs a little bit differently. And I think it's so important for listeners to know that whether you're a teacher or you're a school counselor listening or a parent, um, you definitely want to research the community college you're planning to attend and understand their promise programs. And I think, um, you know, when I, when I think of K-12 access, I think of, it, it really depends on the district and the priorities, right? What's the district's priority? So how are they going to take this new legislation and really system, systematize it across their school district? Or what, or were they going to just, you know, offer workshops one day and during the school day and then say, okay, it's up to you. You have to come on your own. So I really think the inequities happen in, in our region, in our own Inland Empire, it depending on is this a priority for our school district? And with so many competing priorities for our districts right now, um, from um, ensuring students have food, ensuring students are even coming to school, basic needs, some of these things, they, they want to put their attention to it, but they may not be able to. And so it's so hard to say everyone's going to get the same type of support and resources across both Inland Empire when I know everybody has different needs and everyone's dealing with different um, experiences different um, communities. And so um, it's just so important for us to understand, I think for us um, to understand that they, to me, for what I've seen with, with students and families is we push higher, we push higher education, right? We push post-secondary options after high school, not just like I mentioned earlier, it's not about just going to a four-year college, but we want them to go to some post-secondary. And so I think if we all have that message in all high schools and all community colleges in our county in our in our four years as well. Um, that's one way of trying to unify that and close that equity gap. So where are the areas where we need improvement the most and right now? We need to accept that our students are institution school dependent. That 65% at minimum in Dillon Empire, if not in some high schools more, are first in their families to go to college, first in their families to graduate, lower income, low income, their ex expected family contribution is zero, right? And so we, the, what we do of just handing them a paper or just saying, here, go apply and do this or go, we, we're going to continue to get these results that we're getting if we keep doing what we've always done. And so I think what we've learned, what I've learned, and especially during the last, you know, two years during this pandemic, almost two years, is these students need more handholding than we've ever. We need to work stronger on the handoff after they graduate. We have a lot of vision statements in school districts, like all students will graduate high school by this. And that's where it ends. We really truly just say we're done when they walk across the stage. And then we expect them to figure it out after we've fed them sometimes two or three meals. They don't have parents at home. They may be working to even help them. And then we're expecting them to just be adults and navigate this system that can be kind of, you know, confusing for students when they're trying to get into the Promise program or they're trying to go to one of our four-year campuses. So what they want is they don't want necessarily what I when talking to students, the text messaging. And it's great, but it's they need that human connection, that follow-through. If we're going to really recuperate the loss, we've just had significant losses in college enrollment. In the Inland Empire, we're going to have to, more of us are going to have to step in to do that. And it can't just be the school counselors or, you know, it has to be more people in the community accepting that strong, like we're not letting go until you're enrolled and you start your first day of school. Yeah. You're listening to Education Insight. And we're speaking with Catalina Sefuentes. She is the Executive Director of College and Career Readiness for Riverside County's Office of Education and the chair of the California Student Aid Commission. We are talking about changes in student aid on a federal level, but specifically here in the Inland Empire. Now, earlier in the program, we were speaking with E.T. Windsor from the Department of Education's Federal Student Aid Office, and we learned a, a lot about the FAFSA and its importance. 
Do we have a lot of students in the Inland Empire who complete the FAFSA? Catalina, think about that for just a minute as we take a break. How can we, as a community, help local students complete the complicated application and receive more of the millions now available for them for college? The chair of the California Student Aid Commission is with us today. Catalina Sapuentes shares more of her thoughts on that in just a moment. I'm Lacey Kendall. This is Education Insight. Welcome back to Education Insight. Today, discussing federal and state efforts to simplify financial aid for students in the Inland Empire and how to get students in our region more of that money. Catalina Sapuentes, chair of the California Student Aid Commission, joins us. Before the break, I asked if there are as many local students making it through the application process as we would hope. Catalina, what are you seeing? My answer is nowhere near enough that are eligible. Mm. So we have work to do. Um, I, you know, prior to the pandemic, you know, we're making movements with completion. Like I mentioned, you know, some of um, the initiatives at the state light wide level started in our own um, Inland Empire in terms of pushing FAFSA completion. But when you look at class of 21, so when you look at our, our students from last year, in Riverside County, you know, we had 33,400 students um, enrolled, right? And seniors, class of 21, only 19,071 submitted. So that had us at a 53% completion. So we're, we're about half, right? Half of the students. In San Bernardino County, for example, they only had 14,000 students submitted out of 30,000, about a little over 30,000. So they're at 43%. So we're talking, and, and you know, everyone says everyone should get their application. We should have 100%. But the reality is not everyone is, not every student in the Inland Empire is eligible for various reasons. But on average, on my analysis, on looking at our enrollment data and the students we serve, we should get close to 90%. We have about 90% of our students in Inland Empire that probably could qualify and should get the application submitted. So we're, we're sitting at 50 and 40%. We have so much work to do and so much support needed. And the thing that's even worse about that statistic is they're eligible, you know? So I also think this is, I think sometimes too, I'd love to just share that this isn't for those listening, this isn't just a higher education concern or a K-12. This is a, a Inland Empire concern. This is an Inland Empire conversation. When students get financial aid, it doesn't always just go to the campus or the institution. They get money back to buy books. They get money back to buy a laptop. They get money back to, to live, right? And so I think it's important for those listening, understanding like this is revenue, this is income, you know, our, our communities are losing. It's a domino effect of what happens if students aren't um, applying, are receiving the money and getting the support they need to pay their rent to help parents pay the bills in their house. Yeah. Their financial aid and financial aid, state and federal financial aid goes to more than just paying the cost of your classes and your books. And we're building a workforce for industry here yes. in San Bernardino and Riverside County 10 years from now when we're going to need our own folks to fill our own positions rather than bringing people from other communities to fill those jobs. Exactly, exactly. There's, there's, there's missed opportunities. It's so important for more to get involved in the conversation. So those listening, if you're you know, a real estate agent or you're a tax agent, um, we, we, need, we need all those involved to understand it because I think there's a lot of misconceptions too about submitting the FAFSA, about, you know, I don't, I don't want the free money. And it's not that um, if they understood what it means and the investment, for example, I received a Cal grant to get my, my degree. I would not have finished my four-year degree without a Cal grant. I can guarantee everyone listening, I paid, I've paid back my Cal grant 10 times. <laughs> and so it was, an inv it was an investment. And I stayed, in my, I stayed in my community. I was born and raised in Riverside County, and I've stayed here. And I've paid back my grant at least 10 times in, in taxes because of, of what I've been able to do with my education. So it, it's an investment. It's not, not a handout. It's an investment in your future that we can guarantee you we, want, we believe in you and we want you to go to school, 
and you stay here with us, we will see the investment that we gave you. Yeah. So what can we do here in the Inland Empire to increase our completion rates? You know, it's a focus, you know, asking from our school board members to our superintendents, to our to our teachers, to our um, our campus supervisors. This isn't just, like I mentioned, a, five, a school counselor job. Every, you know, it's kind of always lived in the, in the world of school counselors. And I'm not saying we shouldn't, school counselors shouldn't lead those efforts, but um, we need we need more help. We need more people understanding FAFSA completion. We have innovative, some of our high schools, they have, you know, military recruiters that they've trained on how to do a FAFSA. And so they come on campus and they help, right? And now that we're getting back and it's not full, you know, like it used to be, but we're back, we're mass, we're doing workshops in person. Um, I'd say if you're listening, and call your local school district and say, I, I want to help. I love to get fingerprinted and cleared and be a volunteer, um, especially those who are in the um, business world, right? And, and Bank of Americas and Washington Mutuals and, and so those are in those industries, I, anything you can do to make a commitment to help them understand you're willing to work together on college affordability. And I think it's going to take more community um, members talking. One, one of the dreams I've had for the Inland Empire, maybe people listening, if you're a tax, if you do, tax season's going to start. You know, making a commitment, if you come with me, I'll also do your child's FAFSA for you for free. Yeah. You know, that would be an <laughs> awesome, those listening, an awesome commitment, a charge. Because I think they, they'll trust their tax agent, right? Their tax partner. But yeah. to, and so I think that's one goal right there. And I think making those commitments to our students is the first step. But thinking beyond just it's this is the educator role. And it's it, we really we're going to need more help than just our own educators. Yeah. Wow. What a great call out to tax folks to say, why don't you offer to help them with their FAFSA? <laughs> yes. Yeah. Um, have you found that part of the problem, too, is that many of our students and families here in the Inland Empire think that college is simply out of reach financially? Definitely. I would, I would say that because they don't know what they have never seen, experienced, or lived. So if you're first generation, for example, myself, right, first in my family to go to college, the only people in my life up until after I graduated high school that had a degree were the teachers at my school. There was no one else. I didn't have, there wasn't a lawyer in my family or there wasn't someone in my family uh, that understood that went to college. I could talk about college that I could see it. I could, I could, I could envision it. I could, I could connect to it. Yeah. And that's where we're at. It's please don't, and lo, those listening, don't ever think it's because they don't want to or they don't care. They just don't understand it. Early in our program, you mentioned great advancements that are coming from Sacramento and from Governor Newsom. What do you think, and they may be listening, <laughs> what do you think our local policymakers and student aid advocates here in the Inland Empire should be doing right now to more equitably support students in the Inland Empire? I think the first step is we theorize so much on the condition of um, college affordability, the condition on college enrollment. Um, we look at research from, you know, other states or national research. It's time for us to stop and really understand the current condition of our own region first. I think we we jump to solutions too quickly. We we jump to, well, you know, it's just more money. Well, I'm here to tell you our districts, we've been giving funds, federal funds, state funds to get back on track after the pandemic. The solutions that we need don't, sometimes money can't buy along. Right. It's not just more funding, more money is going to solve these these deep rooted problems. So I, I think our legislators are in the Inland Empire, our leaders, board members, superintendents need to come together and truly spend time to understand what is the current condition of what's the current data. Right. So if, if I were to ask, I would love for our assembly members to know they should be knowing that knowing the college going rate of every high school in their in their area. Right. And I think under truly understanding the current condition of the empire and then we're starting to what's the greatest driver, the greatest leverage where they can take to move things. Right. So, for example, not just saying, OK, we want to improve graduation rates, but we want to improve post-secondary enrollment. And I, I can guarantee you the byproduct of pushing more students into school after high school automatically usually means more higher graduation rates for students. So. Um, I think we don't spend enough time and not to sit together to at meetings after meetings to admire the problem. That's not what I'm saying, but to to understand what is our current condition? What is the current condition of that high school, of that school district? What is what's my data right now? And not just jumping to they, you know, they need more funding. They need more money because I 
we have there's funding right now. We have funding to hire teachers and we don't have enough of them. You know, and so that's I I think we don't spend enough time truly understanding the the root cause of some of our problems. This is Education Insight. We've been speaking with Catalina Safuentes, the executive director of College and Career Readiness for Riverside County's Office of Education and the chair of the California Student Aid Commission. Catalina, thank you so much for your time today and for all this great information. Thank you. Thank you for having me. And I just encourage those of you who are listening and want to get involved, please reach out. Reach out to your school district. Reach out to your local community college, your local four-year. You don't have to be an educator to get in the conversation of college affordability. There's plenty of room for more support. This is Education Insight. One former Inland Empire student understands both the difficulty and the value of student aid and how much it can help our community. Angel Rodriguez maneuvered his way through the process to help him pay and complete his education all the way through his master's degree from UCR. He has since dedicated his career to helping other IE students receive the same. As the Senior Director of Marketing, Public Affairs, and Government Relations at the San Bernardino Community College District, and recently hand-selected by Governor Newsom to also serve on the California Student Aid Commission. Angel, congratulations on your recent appointment to the California Student Aid Commission by the governor. Could you tell us a little bit about that? Thank you, Lacey. Well, really excited to be here with you. And yes, I'm very honored to serve on the Student Aid Commission. I'm very grateful to the governor for his appointment, but I'm very, very excited to help represent the Inland Empire and a lot of the, the families and friends that I have here who I know want to go to college and they sometimes wonder how they can afford it. And so now serving on this position, uh, I know that I can uh, help them navigate those sort of uh, resources that the state of California provides. I think it's noteworthy that the new appointee understands the value of student aid personally. Could you describe for our listeners how it changed the path of your education? Yes, Lacey. Well, I'll tell you, I'm the oldest of three younger brothers. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm also the oldest of uh, many of my cousins who are here in California. Uh, my parents are from Mexico City. And they came to the uh, Inland Empire in the late 90s and the early 90s. And, you know, being the oldest one, I'll have to say, felt a little bit lonely because I was typically the one helping either my parents or younger brothers navigate school systems and all the bureaucracy that, you know, goes into sign up for classes or uh, even the process of going to college. So that for me, I had to figure that for myself. And fortunately enough, I had great mentors and teachers at school. But for the most part, I had to ask you know, the things that I didn't know, or, you know, when you're young, you don't know what you don't know. And so there was a lot of um, struggle of finding out those answers that, I, that you know, frankly, my, my parents couldn't answer or help me navigate. And so, you know, during that time, and I'll tell you that it was during the, um, during my middle school, high school years, uh, my parents doing, were doing quite well for themselves, you know, even though they were immigrants to the country uh, for a long time. Uh, they were street vendors. Uh, they used to have a, a makeshift taco stand and uh, I would help them out, you know, during my upbringing. I would help them out, uh, whether it was flipping tortillas or, you know, uh, helping customers. And eventually uh, we saved up enough money to open up our own small restaurant in Rancho Cucamonga. And so being a part of that, you know, it kind of helped me understand hard work. It kind of helped me understand how to work with people different from me. But it also helped me understand the value of, you know, perseverance. But all of that, I'll, I'll say, came to a screeching halt with a great recession. Um, we lost our home. We lost our business. Mm. Uh, my parents really couldn't uh, make ends meet uh, during that time. And by the time the great recession hit, I was midway through my uh, undergraduate career at UC Riverside. I'll tell you, if it weren't for Cal Grants, financial aid, I would not have been able to finish. And uh, be the first one in my family to get a college degree. Yeah. Well, how did you persist through college despite those setbacks? Because I, I know that as the story plays out, you have a degree now from UCR. Tell us about that. I do. And uh, frankly, I'll say that those tough times really helped our family become stronger. 
like I said, we lost our home through a foreclosure. You know, it was expensive to keep the business open, so they had to close it. But the one thing that my parents reinforced in us is that no matter where we live, family is home. And I'll say that that was really the foundation for uh, where I, you know, found strength uh, during those difficult times. But I'll, I'll also say, I mean, I'll, uh, I was blessed that uh, I filled out the FAFSA, the federal application for uh, free student aid. I got Cal Grants uh, that helped me put, you know, helped me through my college career and I was able to afford it. Those two things, I think my family support, financial aid, Cal Grants really made the difference. And eventually, as uh, I continued my career and I was finishing off my undergraduate degree at UC Riverside, I applied for internships and, you know, jobs at a time when, like I said, during the Great Recession, there weren't many jobs available at that time. So I'm part of that generation that struggled to find a good paying job after college. And what I did land was an internship. And fortunately, uh, that opened the door for me to, you know, uh, work with community members and work with educators uh, working in, in different spaces in the LN Empire. And that really opened the door for me to hone in and, and start my career in higher education and, and what I do now. Angel, there's a lot of students, no doubt, listening today who aren't quite sure if college is possible in terms of access and especially affordability, as we're discussing here today, what would you say to them? You know, I think for a lot of families who have never thought about going to college themselves, their biggest misconception is about the affordability, that college might be too expensive, that tuition is, you know, out of reach. I'll tell you about a couple of programs at the community college level uh, especially here in, in the San Bernardino Community College District, what we've seen is that about eight out of 10 students get free tuition when they fill out the FAFSA form or the California Dream Act. Eight out of 10 students get free tuition. So that at the community college level, I, I think just widens the net for so many families to say, I can go, it's possible, I can do it. Yeah. At UC, uh, you might know that there's a program called the Blue and Gold Program. And that basically says that if your family makes less than $80,000 per year, you also get free tuition at any UC. Those are great opportunities. But also at the California Student Aid Commission, there's many, many programs that we offer to students. And I just described my experience as, you know, a son of immigrants, uh, you know, a product of the Atlanta Empire, uh, being low income, you know, um, Cal Grants, like I said, was a big program that really helped me. But even if you don't fit in that same uh, life experience that I had, if you are a middle class student, there's also grants for middle class families. If you are a foster youth, there are grants if you are a foster youth. If you are a, a son or daughter of uh, military uh, veterans or your uh, parents are in you know, uh, firefighting or public uh, safety, there's also uh, grants for you to afford college. And also, like I, like I said, for uh, law enforcement personnel dependents, there's so many opportunities for a lot of uh, Californians. And so, the first key to accessing all of that is filling out the FAFSA form or the California Dream Act application. Once again, Angel Rodriguez, the Senior Director of Marketing, Public Affairs and Government Relations at the San Bernardino Community College District and a member of the California Student Aid Commission. Angel, thanks for taking a call today and speaking with us. Thank you, Lacey. If you'd like to learn more about new and existing financial aid opportunities, go to www.csac.ca.gov. We hope you'll join us for upcoming editions of Education Insight. Some of the story ideas we're working on are pre-K. How big a difference does it really make in a child's education? And how much will the new federal government funding help pre-K here in the Inland Empire. Be sure and join us for that and so much more. I'm Lacey Kendall. Education Insight is produced in partnership with KVCR San Bernardino. Our executive producer is Jacob Poor, and our production engineer is Tyler Vizi. Alyssa Silva is our production assistant and Lacey Kendall is your host. Support is provided by Growing Inland Achievement, working together for inland education and economic success.
and by College Futures Foundation. Do you have questions or suggestions for the future topics we should be covering? Write to us at educationinsight.org. Join us again next time for Education Insight.